All right, welcome back to Planet Doug behind the scenes for Friday, February 2nd, 2024. It's kind of an interesting day here on uh, Planet Doug because tomorrow morning I'm leaving Madan and uh, all this time I'd been, I'd, I'd just been assuming I was going to fly from Sumatra back to Kuala Lumpur. And then in the end, um, I just, I changed my mind. I decided to go back by ferry and that has turned into a bit of an adventure, but that's a good thing because the reason I decided to try the, the ferry route, well, I guess there are two reasons why. One, I discovered that it was possible because there used to be ferries going in and out of a town called uh, Tanjung Balai. And in the old days, I would take a ferry from Port Klang to Tanjung Balai. So that was the ferry route that I followed going in and out of uh, Sumatra. But then during COVID, whatever company was running those boats uh, stopped. I don't know whether they went out of business or whether they still exist, but those ferries no longer existed. Uh, when I was in Kuala Lumpur, I actually hopped on the uh, KTM train just to confirm it. Because, you know, when you look things up online, you don't know for sure what you're seeing is true or not. I only trust my own eyes and ears. So I hopped on the KTM train and I rode all the way down to Klang, which is actually a very fun ride and it's very easy to do because the KTM train goes all the way to the end right on the water. And then you, when you come out of the train, um, you're right at the docks. So I could just basically sit in the train in comfort, very inexpensive ride for that, you know, covering that kind of distance. And then I just turned the corner and I walked over to the docks where they used to have these ferries going to Sumatra and the whole place was just shuttered, um, closed. And I talked to a few people there and they said, no, 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 that there are, there are no longer any ferries out of Port Klang going to anywhere in Sumatra. So that whole route was finished. But then I recently learned that the same company that I used, Indomal Fast Ferry, to go to Dumai, they recently started up their a ferry service to Tanjung Balai. They don't operate out of Klang, they're still operating out of Port Dixon, but now they also have a boat going to Tanjung Balai, which is nearer to Madan. It's about four hours away from here by bus or by train, but you know, in Sumatran terms, that's, that's nearby. You know, a four hour trip is considered close here in the big island of uh, Sumatra. So anyway, I found out that there was a ferry option going from Tanjung Balai to Malaysia. And then, so that's the main reason I decided to do it. And the second reason is that, well, it's just more interesting. Um, I'm gonna have to, I had to navigate all kinds of things to get there for one thing, get a train ticket from Madan to Tanjung Balai. And the fact that I could go to Tanjung Balai by train is also another reason I decided to do this because I just wanted to have the experience of riding on a train at least once while I'm here. So I can take the train to Tanjung Balai. I mean, if I had to go there by bus, I probably wouldn't have done it, but the fact that I can get there by train, I really like that. So, so I have to book a train ticket and then I have to find a place to stay in Tanjung Balai for a couple of nights. And then you go to the dock and then take a boat from there to Malaysia. You know, I think it's just, it's more interesting experience overall than flying because you know flying is the obvious way to go especially from Madan because Kuala Namu is an international airport they've got an express train that goes straight to the airport so I could be you know in at the airport in an hour and then it's a one hour flight to Kuala Lumpur that's the uh, obvious way to go and in fact the ferry ticket and an Air Asia flight cost about the same. In fact, I think by the time the dust settles, the ferry might even be a little bit more expensive. So you don't save any money by taking the boat and you don't save any time because the, the flight is one hour, but I, it looks like the ferry ride is something like six or seven hours. So it's far longer to, far longer, a little bit more expensive and much more complicated to go by boat, but the advantage is you're going by boat. And that, to me, that's always um, better. <laughs> and anyway, I have it all arranged. So I'm talking about this like I still have to do all these things, but everything is already booked. 
So I have my train ticket booked. It leaves tomorrow morning at seven in the morning, which is what makes today interesting. And then my ferry leaves on Monday morning, February 5th, I think at 9.30 in the morning, something like that, and arrives in Port Dixon at 4.10 in the afternoon. So it's a whole day journey on the boat. So I'm really looking forward to that. And another reason I like this boat option is that it brings me to Port Dixon rather than right into KL. To be honest, when I was thinking about flying into KL, I was a little bit uh, unexcited, if that's a word. I was a little bit lukewarm on the idea of just, again, landing at the airport, taking the airport bus to KL Central, and then there I am in Kuala Lumpur in the morning. And then, I don't know, I just didn't feel the sense of excitement about waking up in KL. Um, especially because we're so close to Chinese New Year. Oh my goodness, another holiday. I mean, <laughs> this is one of my pet peeves about life in Asia, that um, there are so many different um, you know, religions and calendar systems that lead to so many holidays. And every time you turn around, there's another huge holidays. And of course, Chinese New Year means Everybody's on the road. All the hotels are going to be fully booked. The hotels are going to double, triple, quadruple their prices. It's just a horrible time um, to be going anywhere or being anywhere because all, all the transportation systems are jammed, hotels are fully booked, and then everything is really expensive. So it's just really annoying. And we just came out of Christmas New Year, which was the same thing, you know. So the, the, the calendar year in a country like Malaysia or Indonesia just has so many holidays because you have the, you know, the holidays according to the Islamic calendar, the Western calendar, the Buddhist calendar, you know, the um, uh, Hindu calendar. I mean, every time you turn around, government offices are closed and hotels are fully booked because there's another holiday. They, they just, and every time I go somewhere, I don't, I don't plan ahead very well, I guess, but my visa just happens to be expiring three days before Chinese New Year. So it's like I'm landing in Malaysia at like kind of the worst possible time. Of course, it's a good time if you're thinking about, you want to shoot YouTube videos about the Chinese New Year celebrations. You could do that, but I've sort of been in this part of the world for so many Chinese New Years the excitement isn't there anymore. You know, I, I don't instantly feel like I have to go out and film a, you know, a lion dance and look at all the decorations at the big shopping malls in KL, because they always go, you know, they go extreme with their decorations for the big holidays. Every, you know, big shopping mall is a huge Christmas display and then a huge, probably even bigger Chinese New Year display. And they're all very beautiful and very well done. And it's interesting to go see them, but it is something that I have done on multiple occasions, so I don't get that excited about it. Um, yeah, so anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm walking straight into the jaws of Chinese New Year holidays, and at this point, I still haven't prepared for it. So that's my fault, but I, you know, my, my plans for returning to Malaysia were in flux, so I hadn't booked anything in advance. And right now I have a hotel my old hotel, the one I really like in Port Dixon, um, it's perhaps not the best hotel for me right now, now that I think about it. Um, I've already, I booked that place for three nights when I arrive, and then I'm thinking I don't know where I'm going to go after that. I mean, I could go up to Kuala Lumpur, I could go to Malacca, I could do something else in Malaysia. So I've sort of been leaving that open-ended. And I was thinking that this um, low-budget hotel in Port Dixon that I like may not be the best this time because I don't have any transportation. When I was there last time, I had my bicycle, so it was just an easy thing for me to hop on my bike. I could ride into town in, in, you know, if I needed to because this hotel is about three kilometers outside of downtown. And it's a good area. I like the area, in fact, and there's a restaurant right beside the hotel. It's the um, PD Seafront Hotel, the Port Dixon Seafront Hotel. 
It's about three kilometers, as I said, outside of town. And if you want to do something in Port Dixon, well, you got three kilometers to cover three and a half, maybe. And I would just do that on my bicycle, you know, every second day or something, and it was fine. And if I wanted to visit the museums and historical areas, things like that, I could just get there by bicycle, which is why I love having a bicycle. But this time I don't have it with me. So when I get, when I arrive at the dock in Port Dixon, I'll probably just walk to the hotel. You know, it's from the dock, maybe two, two and a half kilometers. And I'll, I'll just walk there. But once I'm there, you know, I can, I can walk into town. That's not a big deal to me to walk three kilometers. But, you know, if it's something very casual, you just want to go to the mall and buy some instant coffee or something. Yeah, you know, a three and a half kilometer walk there to, you know, go to a grocery store and three and a half kilometers back. I mean, unless you're a serious walker looking for exercise in the heat of Malaysia, yeah, that, that's a bit of a stroll and it might get annoying over time, you know, if you stay there a while. So it may not be the best hotel for me, but I have it booked for three nights. After that, once we get into Chinese New Year and all the prices explode, like I said, I, I don't have anything booked in advance at this point. So yeah, we're, gonna, we're going to see what happens after that. It, it could be interesting. I have a few things to do today, of course, to prepare for departure tomorrow morning. So I, I can't talk here for very long, but um, I don't have a lot to do, just a few things. So I do have some time that I can have a little bit of a chat. And uh, one story I wanted to tell about Planet Doug was the adventure of booking the train ticket. I don't really need to tell this story, to be honest, because I did this yesterday and I took my GoPro with me and I filmed kind of an old school Planet Doug video. I used to shoot a lot of these videos where I was just doing something in my life, like shopping for a GoPro adapter. And then I would make a video about going to the mall and going to the stores and buying this gizmo. And I've sort of moved those stories from Planet Doug to this behind the scenes channel. Like rather than take video of those events, I've sort of been doing them without my cameras. And then I just tell the story here on uh, behind the scenes. And that was mainly because it takes so long to edit videos that once I was making all these videos about my daily life and daily errands, that took up 100% of my time. And then there was really no time left over if you wanted to do an actual travel video of some kind. So it was sort of consumed my whole life. So anyway, I stopped making those kinds of videos, but yesterday I thought, uh, yeah, let's go old school. So even though all I was doing was walking to the train station to buy a train ticket and then walking back again, I thought, well, let's document it. And normally it would be, it's kind of a behind the scenes event, but I shot video about it and I went deep, deep into the details of it as I do, as I like to do. So all this information is in this other video if assuming I edit it and post it as a Planet Doug video. So everything I'm going to say right now is repeating what's in the Planet Doug original video. But who knows? I thought, um, you know, repeat, a, tell, retell the story a little bit, looking back at yesterday, and I'll try and keep it a condensed version. So the issue was that the last time I went to the train station to buy a ticket, I couldn't do it because they have this system where if you show up in person, like you physically go to the train station, stand in line, go up to the ticket window and buy your ticket, they won't let you. You can't do it because the on, you can only buy the ticket for a train that's leaving on that day or perhaps you can buy the ticket the day before. But if you go to the train station like three days four days before your train that you want to buy a ticket for, they say, no, you can't do it yet. You have to wait until, you know, the day before the train departs. So that was my experience when I went there last time. And in this case, I went to the train station yesterday because I need to confirm this ticket. It's important for me to get to Tanjung Balai by a certain date to get this ferry. If I don't, of course, and then I'm really stuck because my, my, um, visa expires. It expires on Tuesday. 
and I'm leaving the country on Monday. So if anything goes wrong, I'm in deep trouble. So yeah, I want to book my train ticket in advance. I want to get that locked down. So even though it was two days before departure, I thought, I don't know, let's go see if I can do it. And the last time that I did this, and they said, no, you can't buy a ticket, it was for a train to Sientar. And that was a, like a, a, re, a local train. And it was in a separate category. So I thought maybe this train going to another city like Tanjambalai, farther away, that's in a different class. That's an intercity, like regional train. And maybe the rules are different. And maybe I can buy a ticket for that one two days in advance. Turns out that wasn't true. I got to the train station. I went to the customer service window to ask about it. And they says, oh, for that train, you can only buy tickets three hours before the train leaves. So the other one, at least I could buy it the day before. But for this train, they told me, no, you can't buy a ticket until three hours before the train leaves, which to me is not going to work because in order to do that, I mean, I have to, you know, cancel my hotel reservation here, pack up everything, go down to the train station and hope, you know, you just cross your fingers that there's a seat available. Like, I don't know, like, aren't trains sold out most of the time, getting close to Chinese New Year? It's a weekend, it's a Saturday, it's going to be busy. So I, I can't do that. I can't just pack up and go to the train station and then just hope that there's a ticket available. So I need to get it in advance. And then I went down this uh, long rabbit hole because the customer service people at the train station are amazing. Uh, the two times I've been there, they've had these young women there. And they, they remind me very much of my guide that I had at the Chong Afi mansion. Um, very well put together, nicely groomed, speaking very English, very, very English, speaking very good English, very personable and polite, helpful, you know, very, very good customer service. So I went back there, sat down at the customer service window. There wasn't a lineup. And then I started talking with the woman and I explained to her that I had tried to book a ticket online. I'd done everything I could think of. Every app I could find, every online booking system. I'm doing my dumb Google searches. You know, how do you buy a train ticket online from Madan City? Then I'm getting all the, you know, you're going down the, into the forums, people discussing it. Use this app, use this app, go to this online system. And I went through all of them. I spent like a day doing this and I could not book a ticket. Every single portal, every app, every online system, there was a barrier that I was unable to book a ticket. Most of them just crashed. Um, I would just get in these very amusing error message. I would go through the whole system, input all of my information, put in, you know, the, the, the train I wanted to take. And then it says at the bottom, you know, continue or submit. And then I hit continue. And then I get this big error message every time that says, you know, oh, there was one that had a very funny message. I guess they thought they had a sense of humor, but I can't remember what it was. You know, it's like, I don't know, the herd stampeded and uh, everything, nothing worked. So please try again later. And you try again later. And, and every single time I tried, I just got the same message about how there's something wrong and uh, we can't complete your request. So I just gave up and I walked to the train station. And then the first thing the woman said to me was, oh, did you try the app? And I didn't know what she meant. And I said, well, I tried like a dozen apps, um, like everything from, you know, Traveloka, one to go Asia. I went to the, I tried to find the official Indonesian train system website. There was a booking system there. I mean, I did everything I could think of and none of them worked. But then she says to me, did you try the app? And I'm like, well, I tried a whole bunch of apps and none of them would work. And then she says, well, I can help you with the app. She kept referring to one app in particular, and I didn't know what she was talking about. And she says, well, you know, give me your phone, you know, let, like show me the app and, and then let's, uh, I will do it for you. And then she looked at my phone and says, well, oh, you don't have the app. I was like, I don't know what app you're talking about. Like is, like, is there a magical app that I was supposed to be using all this time? And the answer to that question is yes. <sighs> Turns out 
that the Indonesian railway system covering regional trains, intercity trains, and airport express trains, they have their own dedicated app. I didn't know that. I never stumbled across this news and nobody told me this. Like when I went to the train station the first time to go to Sientar and the, you know, I guess I could say the customer service rep failed me here because she told me, no, we can't sell you a ticket, uh, but you, you have to do it online. That's all she said. You know, you have to do it online. You know, go home and do it online. That's all she said. She never told me about this app. And I run into this problem all the time. I think it's a human perspective problem because in her mind, the app is common knowledge. She doesn't think she needs to specify because everybody knows about the app. It's the train station app. You know, she works with it all day. All Indonesians apparently know about it. They all have it. They all use it. But as a visitor to Indonesia, I didn't know about it. It never came up. And the funny thing is that when I was talking with the second customer service window person, this woman, at one point I kind of looked up above me and at the top of her window, like where I'm sitting in a chair at her window, and above her at the top of the window, there was a huge sign advertising this app, giving the name of it and saying, you know, like download our amazing app and you can book your tickets and cancel your tickets and, you know, it named all the amazing things this app can do. And I'm like, well, this, <laughs> I hate to say it, this is the first time hearing of this app. I didn't know this app existed. So anyway, she took my phone and then she started downloading the app to my phone. And then we were, you know, she was going to help me buy a ticket through the app. But that was kind of, that ended up being quite a little bit of a dead end because I'm sitting in front of her customer service window, people waiting behind me, and it's going to take a long time to download. And even then, I, I'm still going to have to set up an account, right? It's not like, oh, app is there, book. No, I'm going to have to sign up. So I'm going to have to enter my email address, create a password. They're going to send an activation link to my email address. I'm going to have to activate it. I'm going to have to input my phone number. And in order to confirm the validity of the phone number, they're going to have to send me a text message, giving me a one-time TTP code, whatever that is. You have to get that code from the text message, enter it into the app. You know, it's going to be a long process before we even get to the point where I can book a train ticket. So we're waiting for the app to download and it's like, oh, it's going to take 15 minutes to finish the download. And then this woman started making suggestions to me. She said, well, what we can do is, um, I won't go through all the details. Basically, she was going to do it for me in some way, and then she was going to pay for it using her bank account. She was going to go that far that she was going to, you know, once I download the app, I can buy the train ticket, but I won't be able to pay for it because I have no online payment systems. She said, that's okay. I will link my bank account to your app and then I will pay for it and you can give me cash. And I kind of went, oh no, that's very kind of you, but I can't put you to that much trouble. And in the end, she just got out her phone, opened up this magical train station app book the ticket, put in my name, my pass, my, my yeah, passport number, and then she paid for it in advance. No, well, she was going to pay for it in advance and I was going to give her cash, but I stopped her again and says, no, I, I can't have you do that. And I asked her, is like, is there another way that you can book it for me, but I can pay directly and like go to Indomaret, for example, and she's, oh yeah, that's easy. We can do that. I'm like, oh, for Pete's sake, <laughs> if that was possible, like we should have started there. And she basically booked a ticket, chose pay at a convenience store. And then normally you would take your phone, go to the convenience store. They scan the, you know, the, the code on your phone and then you pay them and you get a receipt. But in this case, of course, she had done it on her phone and I can't take her phone to the convenience store. So then I had to take out my phone and take a picture of her phone so that I had like a screenshot 
of the, re the booking reservation, and then I could take my phone with the photograph on it, go to the Indomaret, show them that, they can put in the code, and then I could pay them, I get the receipt, and now that I had the receipt to show that I had paid, I went back to the train station, went back to the customer service window, gave her the receipt, okay, I've paid. She could enter the details into their computer, and finally, after a very, very long time, um, she was able to print out a ticket for me. So that was all done. But then I, I went a little bit crazy. From there, I went to a, um, a big fancy shopping mall because I just wanted to keep the video rolling and I thought I'd go for a Starbucks coffee at a, a shopping mall and show what this fancy shopping mall looked like. And while I was sitting there drinking my coffee, I was looking at this... Um, you know, t Indonesian railway train ticketing app. I had, it, it had finished downloading. So I thought, oh, just for fun, why don't I go through the process of signing up for an account and just see what it's all about? I didn't need it anymore, but I thought, who knows, maybe in the future and just for the sake of experience, let's do this. So I did that and it was a long, complicated, difficult process. I won't go into all the details, but it was not easy to do, but I finally got it set up and I made my own mistakes that were sort of mistakes, but not mistakes because a lot of the problems came from the fact that the app was in Indonesian. There was no English version and I looked everywhere. I went all over every screen looking for the language button that would allow me to change it from Indonesian to English and it just wasn't there. I couldn't find it anywhere. So I just concluded there was no English version. So I was doing everything with two phones. I had the app open on this phone and I had this phone set to Google Translate, the camera app, you know, the, the camera view of Google Translate. And I would do something on the app and I get a, a window telling me to do something. And I take this phone and I'm translating it in real time and I have to read it. Oh, okay, okay, that's what I need to do. I hit a button, I get more Indonesian. Oh back to Google Translate. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But then I was getting a whole bunch of error messages along the way. And these error messages were not very helpful because they didn't stay on the screen. They flashed for like quarter of a second, half a second. You know, I, I'd hit a button and then I get this error message, like a black bar with red lettering or red lettering with a black bar. And it would just like flash on the screen and then vanish. So there isn't enough time to Google Translate it because it's gone. So now what I had to do was turn on my camera and then time it so that the, the, the millisecond that the error message showed up on the screen, I took a picture of it. That wasn't easy to do, but I managed to do it. And then once I had a picture of the error message on this phone, then I had to turn on Google Translate on this phone, turn on the camera. This is the one running the app. But now I have to switch out of the app to the Google Translate, turn on the camera, and now I'm translating the error messages. I was like, oh, okay. And then I go back to here, I get another error message. Oh, for Pete's sake. I have to try and take a picture of it again and then flip them around. And I'm like, Google Translate, Google Translate. You know, I'm like two-fisting the, uh, the smartphone, you know, while I'm enjoying my uh, cafe latte at Starbucks. And there are more and more and more problems, but I eventually got everything done. And then I'd come this far, I've got this crazy idea. It's like, well, the train ticket was not that expensive. It's a four hour train ride to Tanjung Balai, but the ticket cost, you know, a dollar seventy US for my seat. And I, I picked a window seat and I knew that the seat beside me was not reserved. It looks like the train was going to be largely empty and the seat beside me was still empty. So I thought, well, just for fun, I've gone to all this trouble to get this app working. I opened an account. Why not use it? Like, let's book a ticket. So I actually went through the whole procedure of booking a seat and I booked the one beside me. And then I had to pay for it. So I chose the Indomaret option. And then 
after I booked the second seat, then I left from Starbucks and I went to Indomaret and I paid for the second ticket and then I took the payment receipt and went back to the train station and then gave it to the customer service woman. Of course, she was completely befuddled and um, I was explaining to her that, okay, I'm a very weird individual sometimes and I, I know you already, I already bought a ticket. I have a ticket on the train, but just for fun, I wanted to try out the app, so I bought a second ticket. So I'm here to get ticket number two. And then she's sort of processing this, you know, just like, so, and then she's like reading everything back to me. She says, okay, so you already have a ticket, but you bought another one? And then of course she's assuming, okay, now he wants to cancel the first one and keep this one? Or what exactly are you doing here? And I had explained to her, no, I want to keep both of them. So now I have two seats and you know, I, I figure it's an advantage, why not? I've got one window seat and then I've got the aisle seat and I'll take my backpack and I'll just put it in the aisle seat and I'll, I'll have um, elbow room. You know, I bought two seats. So she eventually figured out what it was I was doing for my personal nutty reasons. And then she printed out the second ticket. But then things got really interesting because I was, you know, I do this to people in customer service all the time. I think they start dreading it when, when uh, Planet Doug comes to town because I like to talk about things, clearly. And I want to share my experiences. So when I'm talking with this customer service woman, I don't want to just have a logical cut and dried exchange, book this ticket, thank you very much, and walk out. I want to have a chat. I want to talk about it. I want to tell my stories. So I'm explaining to her about a little bit about how I had, you know, it was a bit of a struggle using the app. And I said, because yeah, it's only in Indonesian. So I had trouble figuring it out. And then she said, oh, it's in English too. And I was like, oh, for Pete's sake, it is? I couldn't find it. And then interestingly, she, she took my phone to show me how to change it to English and they do it in a unusual way. So she showed me, you go to account and then in account, way down at the bottom, it says Bahasa Indonesia. And I don't know if, I don't think I ever saw that when I was looking. Um, I, can, I looked at account and it had, you know, profile picture, passport number. It looked like my account details. I was looking for settings, you know, or e like on the front page. Usually it's up in the top right hand corner. There's always a button there, change language. You can change from Bahasa Indonesia to uh, English, you know, back and forth. Or you go into settings and then you look for settings. Oh, language setting. And then you choose your language. But for whatever reason, there, there was nothing like that, but if you went into your own personal profile, your account, down at the bottom, kind of off screen, it said Bahasa Indonesia. And then if you turn Indonesian off, then it automatically switches into English. See what I mean? It's not a lang like choose your language and then you get a drop down list and you select your language. It just defaults to Indonesian and then if you go to that setting and turn it off, so you have to turn off Indonesian in order for the system to show English. So it's not like you're choosing English, you're turning off Indonesian and then it switches to English. So it's like, that's why I couldn't find it. I'm okay. But now, now, now I know, you know, and she explained that to me and she explained to me that, well, now that you have the app, you don't even need a ticket. Like I have this whole problem with the system where you book your ticket online, you go to a convenience store to pay for it, but then you still have to go to the train station and trade in your receipt for a physical ticket. So it's not very efficient. And I said that to her as well. And she says, no, no, you don't have to do that. On the app, there's a boarding pass, just like at an airport. So I was like, oh, for Pete's sake, well, I didn't know that either. <laughs> you know, if two months ago I had found out about this app, it would have made my life so much easier because to my surprise, it's not just an app for buying 
regional train tickets. It's got everything built into it. It has like some sort of a, you know, smartphone data plan purchasing system. It has a e-wallet system. You can use like, you know, train station pay, whatever it's called, you know, to pay for things online and go to stores, they can scan it. It's like an e-wallet and it also books airport train tickets. So when I first came to Madan two months ago, I had trouble because I wanted to take the airport express train and I couldn't buy a ticket because everything was digital. But if I had this app when I was back in Malaysia, you know, if I knew about this app, I would have downloaded the app and oh, I could book my airport express train ticket while I was still in Malaysia and I could just book it right on the app because that's part of the app. It's um, the name of it is, I have it here, let me call it up real quick. The name of it is Access by KAI. And KAI, I don't know what that means. It must be Indonesian, um, something to do with train station. But yeah, I mean, I, I've just opened up the app and it has KAI Pay, like K Pay and it has KPay activation. So I could turn on a KPay e-wallet and you can scan codes, top up your account. You can, you know, connect it to your bank accounts, connect it to your credit card. You can buy inner city bus tickets, local bus tickets, commuter bus lines, um, no, computer train, commuter train lines, airport buses, something called KCIC. I don't know what that is. Hotel bookings phone credits, data plans, travel entertainment, preview. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It's a huge app. And it looks like if you're coming to Indonesia for a holiday, download that app. You're going to get a lot of use out of it. But of course, I didn't know about it. Nobody mentioned it, it never came up. And, um, but now I know about it, now I have it. And of course, I'm leaving in two or three days. <laughs> But yeah, that's how these things all work. So to sum up, everything is set. Um, I talked about buying my ferry ticket, but um, I haven't paid for it yet. So basically tomorrow morning, I'm taking the train from Madan to Tanjung Balai. And hopefully I'm, I'm arriving there just after 11 in the morning and I'm going to go directly, I hope, to the Indo Mall ferry office, pay for my ticket. Maybe they can make arrangements for a shuttle bus to take me to the port in the morning, because um, I'm gonna have to go there pretty early. Maybe they have a shuttle bus for customers, I'll find out. And then of course I have to stay overnight, two nights in Tanjung Balai, and then I get on the ferry Monday morning, ferry takes me to Port Dixon. I arrive late afternoon, four o'clock, and then I'm just gonna walk to my hotel collapse and then I'm gonna have three I've booked three nights in Port Dixon and then of course I've got Chinese New Year just thundering in my direction and I still don't know what I'm going to do I suppose I, I'm not really in the mood to go to KL I keep talking about going to Malacca so if, if anyone who knows when I'm gonna post this video uh, maybe I'll try to post it really soon and then if anyone has any suggestions about uh, spending Chinese New Year in Malacca or Johor Bahru, like some other city other than KL, and then has a suggestion about an inexpensive place to stay in either. There won't be one in, in Malacca, but maybe in Johor Bahru. I think that would be an interesting city to, to spend some time in, you know, very normal, ordinary kind of uh, Malaysian uh, city. Did I say Indonesian earlier? I meant Malaysian, of course, and um, yeah, so if I can find a place to stay there for the, you know, seven or eight day period of the holidays, that would be kind of cool. And then I don't have to worry about constantly being, you know, arriving places and being told, you know, we're fully booked. And yes, we do have a room, but it costs $9,000, right? So I, I don't want to run into that situation, but we'll, we'll see what happens, so. Yeah, I could end up staying in Port Dixon for the Chinese New Year holidays just out of convenience because I'm already there and traveling around during Chinese New Year could be such a hassle. Maybe I'll just stay there if I can work that out on a, uh, on a low budget.
The one other problem I'm facing right now is a typical one is I, don't, I haven't booked a place to stay in Tanjung Balai. And the reason I haven't booked a place is because they're all Oyo hotels. Ugh. You know, like Oyo has taken over all of the low budget hotels in Sumatra and all of them have the same problem. I went, I've been, I was trying to book one of them and the prices are good. You know, they're right in line with what I'm paying here in Madan. But then you go to the reviews and all the reviews say the same thing. They're like one star reviews. All these hotels have like two out of 10 for their rating on Agoda or something like that because people book the hotel on Agoda or Booking.com or Traveloka, whatever they use, they book the hotel, pay for it in advance, and then they show up at the Oyo Hotel and then they won't give you a room, which is common here in Sumatra. They say, no, we won't accept online bookings. And yet they're listed online on all these online sites. I mean, I can book the room on, Ag on Agoda right now. It's right there. They have rooms available. I, you know, they, the hotels look reasonable. You know, people describe them as dirty and noisy and full of cockroaches and this and this and that. But, you know, that doesn't freak me out. That's normal for a low budget option, right? So I, I, I take all of that with a grain of salt. A lot of these people that complain about hotel conditions, they're used to four star luxury. So when they stay at a low budget hotel, they're shocked at things they probably shouldn't be shocked at. But anyway, so none of that bothers me. Um, but I don't want to show up at one of these hotels and end up in this ridiculous position where you, you show them your reservation, you've already paid, and then they say, nah, you know, we, we, you know, we, we might have a room for you, but you're gonna have to pay again in person, in cash, and you're gonna have to pay four times what you've already paid online and no we're not going to give you a refund that's up to you you know you contact agoda and get your refund and you know it's a it's a horrible situation it astonishes me that after years of this oyo hotels are still doing this all over sumatra it wouldn't somebody have addressed this problem or fixed it and I do have to say, I do get surprised at the severity of negative hotel reviews. That, that kind of seems interesting to me. I mean, if you go, if you look at a restaurant on Google Maps or something, and you look at the reviews, people might give a negative review, but they're not gonna go, you know, uh, scorched earth generally. They'll say, oh, the rice was a little dry and you know the vegetables weren't fresh you know whatever whatever they say you know they'll they'll say what they didn't like about it but they're not going to go scorched earth but with these hotel reviews i mean they're fun to read you know people from europe you know show up in tanjung balai they go to one of these hotels and then they write out this it was the worst experience of my entire life you know they go on and on and on it was disgusting people were horrible they were rude they ripped me off there were people banging on our doors during the night trying to break in and like they go on and on and on like with the worst horror story you've ever read and then you go on to the next review and the next and the next and they all say the same thing and yet this hotel is still in business and they still have you know they're fully booked night after night and you wonder how is that possible how can a hotel have such horrible horrible reviews and yet year after year they're still in business and they're still making money it seems crazy but um yeah that's kind of weird i guess there just aren't enough hotels in the low budget there's like there's a hotel there i was just checking this morning on agoda and there were like two it's kind of weird on agoda when i when i put in tanjung balai as an option it said oh we have 45 listings and i went wow I had no idea there were so many options, but then when I click on it, it gives me four. I don't know how 45 ended up as four, but there are only four listed. The two low budget options were both Oyo hotels with all the negative reviews. And then the next one was like 800,000 rupiah per night or something like that. So, I mean, you're jumping from like 100,000 a night, which is my low budget range, to 800,000 per night, and I don't need that kind of luxury. 
So it's like, those are my options at the moment, you know, low budget, terrible place where they won't accept your online reservation and someone will try and break in and murder you during the night. Or you can stay at this place with a swimming pool and buffet spread for 800,000 a night or something like that. I might have the number wrong, but anyway, I haven't booked anything yet. There are a couple of hotels. If you go on Google Maps, there are some hotels that are listed on Google Maps, but they aren't listed anywhere else. And there's one in particular, I actually stayed there before, called the Asahan Hotel. And right now my idea is to go there and just show up in person. You know, you can not book it online and it's not that far away from the train station. That's another factor. I no longer have my bicycle and I don't have a scooter. So it's not like I can zoom 10 kilometers outside of town. So I'm landing at the train station and then I want to walk to Indomal Fast Ferry and then I want to walk to the hotel and Asahan Hotel is just across the bridge from the train station. I know that area quite well because I've been to uh, Tanjung Balai before. But yeah, even when I was there before, I never really found a good place to stay at a good price. It's a, uh, it's a tough town, you know, it's a little bit of a rough and ready sort of town. And uh, it's kind of why I like it. That's why I want to go through there. It's on the coast. Has a lot of interesting coastal areas with all the fishing boats. The dock area is really interesting. I remember the last times I went there, the road access to the port was unbelievably rough. Just huge potholes filled with mud and water and going through a really busy market area. So going to the dock was a real adventure. It was really interesting and really exciting. Much more interesting than going to an airport. But I don't know what it's like now. You know, maybe they've fixed everything up. The road might be in good condition. Maybe the dock has been improved. Maybe everything is streamlined now. But when I did it before, yeah, it was a, it was a big adventure going in and out of Tanjung Balai. You know, that was like a, a true uh, travel adventure going through this town. So I'm curious to see what it is like now, you know, how much things have changed. I have a technology story that comes out of my experiences yesterday because I went to the train station and I shot video the entire time on a GoPro and I was using my normal Rode Wireless Go microphone. So as I've often mentioned and often shown, I always have a Rode here around my neck, usually underneath my shirt because it's kind of cool. I, I find it works well, even though it's underneath my shirt the uh, audio signal is still quite strong and the shirt acts as a uh, wind muff. If there is wind noise, the shirt blocks the wind noise. And of course, nobody can see it when it's under my shirt. And I like that. It's kind of hidden rather than dangling around my neck like I have a, a necklace on or something like that. So this is what I was using. And over time, this is the microphone system that I use you know, all the time, basically. But Lately, I've been having more encounters with people like you just I guess I always did But I never really tried to capture any of it And I guess one of the reasons I never tried to capture any of it because the audio wasn't there because this microphone is designed to capture my voice This is it's a, I guess you would call it a lavalier mic in a way. It's a lav lav mic and then if I'm talking to another person who's even like right here, it won't pick up their voice. And I'm just, lately I've just been finding that really, really annoying because here in Indonesia, people are very outgoing. And if you go for, if you go for a walk around Medan, just go to the train station. From here to the train station, you'll probably have 10 encounters with people who just want to talk to you. Um, they're sitting there having a cup of coffee, cup of tea, cup of you know, sugar cane juice, and they call out to you and they signal you to come over and they want you to sit down and join them and have a conversation. And if you do that, well, that's great and it's really interesting, but I'd love to have video of that. And I often do end up with some video of these encounters, but then uh, I can't use it because there's no audio to go with it. You can hear my voice clear as day and then the other person, you can barely make out their voice. So audio has become more and more of a problem for me. And one solution, of course, is to use a dual microphone system, which is what I've had. Well, I also have that. This is the, um, 
the Rode Wireless Go 2 system, so it has one receiver, two microphones, so then I can have one of them on me, and then I have another one I can put on a second person. And that works very well if you plan for it in advance. So like when I went to the Zhang Afi mansion and I got a guided tour, when I went to the plantation museum and got a guided tour, I asked the guide, you know, do you mind if I put this on you? And then I would turn on this microphone and they clip it to their clothing in some way. And then now my voice is being recorded here. It ends up on track number one and this audio, their voice is ending up on track number two, which is really handy because they're separated in the editing program. And then you end up with a really nice audio. But even then, if a third person comes up and is now talking to the two of us, their voice isn't being recorded. So it's not ideal. So yeah, this whole issue of audio has been haunting me from day one. And it's been on my mind, so I just thought I'd talk about it a little bit. Because I remember when I first started shooting YouTube videos, when I started shooting video in any way, I had no clue what I was doing. I was looking at, you know, online, like YouTubers talking about the gear they use. And back in those days when I got started, everybody was using a basic shotgun microphone. They were using the, the Rode Video Micro, I think. That was the gold standard. And I was watching all these videos on YouTube and 90% of them were using the Rode Video Micro shotgun mic. So I thought, oh, okay, that's what everybody uses to shoot YouTube videos. I guess I better get one of those. And I went out shopping and I discovered an alternative, which is this one. It's exactly the same as the Rode, but it's made by a company called Boya. And um, I always forget the actual numbering system on it. It could be the, the Boya, uh, I can't remember, yeah, Boya MM1. So this is the Boya MM1 shotgun mic, and it has a big fuzzy windscreen on it. And um, if you pull this off, you can see that the microphone itself is not that big. And but they're very sensitive to wind. That's one thing I figured out right away. The slightest amount of breeze really creates a lot of noise. So you kind of have to use the wind muff. And then once you attach one of these, you know, it ends up very huge and fuzzy. And then because I was using a GoPro that caused all kinds of problems, um, it gets so complicated. So here, you know, you put this thing on a GoPro and right away what you'll notice is it's huge, but this fuzzy bit falls down into the video. So you actually see all the fuzziness. It, stick, it shows up in the video. And Ulanzi, which makes this cage, they solve that by giving you an adapter. You take this adapter and you attach it to the top of your GoPro. It's like a little skyscraper. And then you put that adapter on and then you attach the microphone up here on the skyscraper so it's no longer in the video screen but it ends up being hot you know very high and awkward and things like that but that's not the biggest problem the biggest problem was one i ran into instantly and I, it still confuses me to this day so here's my gopro with a shotgun mic on it here i am talking into the gopro the microphone is pointing at me recording my voice Okay, I find this one to be too quiet, to be honest, but you know, it is recording my voice, da 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 da, hello, here I am in Madan, I'm going to the train station, but then I want to show something ahead of me, so I turn around the GoPro to film ahead of me, but now the microphone is pointing away from me, and you can no longer hear my voice, because I'm behind the microphone. This microphone only records ahead. It's a shotgun mic. That's the whole point. It's directional. So I bought this thing because everybody buys this thing. And I thought, okay, that's what all the experts are using. I'll buy one of these too. So then I was like, I tried it the very first day and I went, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, this isn't going to work. I need a microphone that records no matter where I'm pointing the camera. So this is not going to work. You know, it's, this guy on the motorcycle, on the scooter, he wants to talk to me. I can turn my GoPro around. Now I'm recording his voice. Okay, but now you can't hear my voice. 
So I thought, well, this is stupid. Why, how all these YouTubers, how is everyone in the world using one of these shotgun mics? I don't know how they use it because it's useless. I still have this because it is a good mic for voiceover. Like if you plug this into your laptop or something and then you hold it right here, it has a kind of really like a good studio sound. You know, you can get really close to it, you know, hello everyone, and you get a real bright, clear, crisp sound. So I use it all the time, like for voiceover, but I never use it, you know, on top of the GoPro. So that was the, you know, that's where I started with audio. And then I tried to think of, well, this isn't going to work. What's the alternative? And the alternative is a, la a true lavalier mic on a cord, right? So here's a lavalier microphone and you clip it to your shirt and this plugs into your camera. And now it doesn't matter. You know, the GoPro is pointing towards me. The GoPro is pointing away from me. It doesn't matter the lavalier mic is still picking up my voice exactly the same because the microphone is not on the camera, it's on me. But as I quickly found out that this doesn't really work either because the cord gets in the way all the time. It's really dangerous, causes all kinds of problems throughout the day, it gets caught on things. You know, you put your camera down on the table in the coffee shop and then you turn around to walk away and you forget about the cord and you rip your GoPro right off the table, it crashes to the floor. You know, this cord, this wire, just makes your life miserable. Plus, it has the same problem as the Rode because it records my voice, but it doesn't record the voice of anyone else around me. So lavalier mic, that doesn't work either. You know, shotgun mic, nope, that doesn't work. Rode for me was the best option because 90% of the time back in those days, I'm only recording me, my voice. I'm not talking to other people. And then now that I am talking to other people, you know, I can use a dual mic system, but none of these microphone systems work in this candid situation where I just, a guy rocks up on his scooter and he wants to talk to me. You know, someone signals to me, hey, come, you know, here, I'll get buy you a cup of coffee. Where are you from? And you know, we have the typical conversation. Doesn't work for that either because, um, yeah, I, I'm not getting audio of the other person. So this has been bothering me more. It's been bothering me for years. And I've been investigating so many microphone alternatives and I've never found one that actually works yet. Anyway. And this is on my mind a lot right now because I've been watching all these videos from Baldwin Bankrupt and Backpacker Ben and a third guy that he was with in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, I want to look up this guy's name. I'll be right back. Ah, I was wrong about that. Um, in, it wasn't in Bangladesh. It was when he went through the Darien Gap. He was with another YouTuber called uh, Timmy Carter. And I think he also along with Bald and Bankrupt and Backpacker Ben, all three of them use the Sony camera, you know, the legendary, the, uh, yeah, the mythological Sony FDR-X3000. And I have a long history with that camera. Anyway, I've been watching all of his videos lately, and one thing I notice, and I'm so jealous of, is that he doesn't seem to worry about audio, because the, the key thing about the Sony, I've talked about this before, is that it's not waterproof. So it's not a waterproof camera, so the microphone built into the camera doesn't have a membrane over the top of it. So like GoPros, you know, when they first came out with the, I think the Hero 7, the one that I bought was the very first GoPro that was fully waterproof without a cage. And this was a big deal, you know, a big marketing triumph and a very popular feature. But in order to make the camera fully waterproof, you know, down to like 50 meters underwater or whatever it is, they can't have an exposed microphone. So they actually have to put the microphone inside the camera, like put it in a recess, and then they cover it with some kind of a special plastic to keep it waterproof. But of course, that muffles the sound. And then, of course, you know, GoPros from the Hero 7, you know, the audio was pretty bad and picked up ton way too much ambient noise. So when I tried to use my Hero 7 and I tried to use the built-in microphones, the audio sounded terrible, but not, not only did it just sound terrible, 
it, it was just like a roar of background noise that drowned out all the voices. It just didn't work. But the Sony, because it is not waterproof, the microphones are not covered up. And then it just, from right out of the gate, recorded really usable audio. Like I'm not gonna call it studio level, but for a YouTube travel video, it's perfect. And from what I can tell, watching Bald and Bankrupt's videos, Backpacker Ben's videos, Timmy Carter's videos, you know, you hold the uh, Sony out here, record yourself, and if there's two people with you, one on either side, it records all three voices perfectly. And you turn the camera around and point it away from you, records your voice perfectly, records the voice of the person you're talking to. It's basically a one-stop shop for audio. And I'm so jealous of that. And I've been thinking about it more and more because, um, again, I think I've told this story in the past as well. There was a time when I didn't have any kind of camera and I was planning a trip to Myanmar and by accident, I was going to be landing in Yangon just before Thingyang, their water festival. So I thought, oh, you know, if I'm a good YouTuber, I should go out and capture some of that on video. It's a very popular type of YouTube video, you know, Songkran, you know, the big water festival in, in Thailand. And then it's called Thingyang, something like that, Thingyang in Myanmar. And I thought, oh, well, if I'm going to be walking down the street with like, being hosed and buckets of water being thrown at me, I can't use, you know, a real camera. I have to have a waterproof camera. So then I was looking at buying one and that's when I bought my GoPro Hero 7. And I remember at that time, you know, doing all my usual camera research and I came across the Sony X3000 as an option. So which one should I buy? The GoPro Hero 7 or the Sony X3000? And the Sony is not waterproof, but you can buy a waterproof case for it. So I could still buy it and use it. And in the end, for a variety of reasons, I chose the GoPro. And I do wonder, sitting here now, that what would have happened if I'd bought the Sony instead? Because looking back at my video history, that I've just had, like on my channel, I have video after video after video after video, testing microphones, trying things out. I remember I did all these crazy things at that time, I had a Panasonic G85 camera, and I was hoping to use it walking around because I wanted to have nicer video quality than you get from a GoPro. Um, occasionally, I'd stumble across some YouTube channel where their video just looked amazing, and then I would get all excited about, oh, I really wanted to have nicer looking video than GoPro video. So then I would try and use the Panasonic all the time, but it was just like way too heavy. And then I go back to the GoPro, then back to the Panasonic, you know, driving myself crazy. But at that time, I, you know, I was still dealing with this problem of a shotgun mic only pointing in one direction. So I thought, well, why not buy two of them? So what I wanted to do was put two shotgun microphones on my Panasonic at the same time, one of them pointing forward, one of them pointing backwards. I thought, wow, that seems like a genius solution to me. And then every time you turn your camera around, it doesn't matter because there's always a camera pointing in that direction. But then you ran into serious problems because you're dealing with two audio signals. How do you merge them and get them onto the video track? And I did all these deep dives. I couldn't figure out the answer. You get into this world of buying all of these Y splitter cables and every single cable I bought, none of them would work. Like no matter how I tried to take the audio signal from two microphones and combine them, it just wouldn't work. It just, everything was always screwed up. And it turned out it's not that easy to do. If you want to do that, you have to buy a separate mixer. And it's this big box that sits on top of your camera and has all kinds of inputs and outputs and settings. And it allows you to take two input audio signals and merge them or put them on two separate audio tracks. You know, So now you've added this big mixing device on top. You know, it was just way, way too much. And I kept thinking, why is this so hard to do? All I want to do is hold my GoPro out here and record sound. My voice, their voice, 
the sound of the bus going by. Like, why is this so difficult to do? And then I would see videos, you know, from this X3000. And what, you know, the X3000 has a lot of problems, especially like if you compare it to like a GoPro Hero 12 or uh, Action 4, yeah, there's no comparison. I mean, GoPro and DJI, they've, they've advanced their you know, image quality and the feature set. And of course they have LCD screens. The Action has two of them, you know, that are complete touch screens, you know, the rear and the back. And the Sony X3000 has nothing. It doesn't even have an LCD screen. If you want an LCD screen, you have to buy it separately. And it's like this watch mounted remote control, this giant thing sitting on your wrist that you're controlling your camera with. I mean, it was, I mean, in terms of a feature set and ease of use and menu systems and settings, there's no comparison. Like a, a GoPro or an action is like leagues better. It's only audio that, well, it's audio and field of view because the other advantage of the Sony is that it has optical stabilization. So the stabilization is built into the lens, GoPros and the actions, the stabilization is electronic. So it, nothing is moving. So basically they take the image on the sensor and then they have to crop in so that they can move it around to produce kind of an artificial stabilization. The Sony takes a different approach and the the glass of the lens itself moves to, to provide stabilization, which means it works better, I think, in low light um, and the field of view is wider because on a GoPro, the stabilization is so good because they take an image that starts here and then they crop it down to here. And that gives them all that room, you know, to move around in. So even if you're, you know, on a uh, BMX going up, blah, blah, you know, bouncing a foot and a half in the air every time, the GoPro can adjust for that and keep it smooth. But it's at the expense of cropping in dramatically. The Sony, if the video is this wide, it stays this wide because the stabilization is built into the glass of the lens. And that's a big advantage. They call that the BOSS system, the Sony BOSS system. And Sony and all their wisdom, I don't, they've never, they've never improved on it. They've, I think they abandoned it. So the X3000, they've never come out with the X4000. That whole line of camera, they just dumped it, which everybody is uh, complaining about. But anyway, so when I do watch Bald and Bankrupt's video, I see them, they seem to be holding the camera like this very naturally, and yet the image is so wide, it's taking in three people and it's not distorted. So it's like, ah, that's probably because of the stabilization built into the lens. I mean, if you, if you want to get that wide image on a GoPro, you've got to hold your GoPro out here which is why I have this whole gizmo, because I need to hold the camera as far away as possible. And then you can take the GoPro and set it to super view, like really, really wide, and then you can hold the GoPro here, but then the image is like totally distorted. You get those big curves, you know, on the edges. The Sony X3000, it seems like you can just hold it right here, close to your face, and it gives a nice wide field of view and it looks linear. Everything is in a straight lines. So in terms of audio and field of view, the Sony X3000 is a very attractive option. But of course, it, it dates back to 2016 and the image quality is nowhere near as good as say a Hero 12 or an Action 4. So, but anyway, I've been thinking about that a lot and I thought I would rant and rave about it a little bit here on uh, Behind the Scenes. And then there are other options that I've tested. There are um, cameras like the Deity D4 Duo, and they are exactly what I've been talking about in that it's like a shotgun mic, but it has two microphone capsules, one on the front and one on the back. And in theory, it's recording in both directions. And then you have, you can merge the output 
from the two different microphones and then put them into the same video. And I've tested that microphone and right now sitting here, I can't remember what the problem was, but I got my hands on one. A friend of mine owned one. I borrowed it for a while, did a bunch of testing and it just didn't work. It really did not work. So, and I can't remember why anymore. I'd, I'd have to go back and then figure this out, refresh my memory, but that didn't seem to be an option either. I have one more option out there that I would like to try out, and that is the new GoPro Hero 12. Because GoPro has the media mod, which I despise, but it is an option for audio because it does have a built-in shotgun microphone with a front-facing capsule and a rear-facing capsule. However, with the Hero 9 and the Hero 8 and the Hero 10 and the Hero 11, it didn't work because you could only use one microphone at a time. But with the Hero 12, they've introduced the ability that you put a Hero 12 into the media mod you can turn on both microphones simultaneously. So then it will be recording in that direction and in this direction. So in theory, if I turn the GoPro around, it's going to be recording behind and ahead, no matter what you do. And um, I would like to test that out. You know, the world of YouTube drives me crazy because there are a lot of people out there who, who do all this testing. You know, if you go into YouTube and type in you know, testing the GoPro Hero 12 audio versus the X3000 audio. You know, people are out there testing it, but they never test it in real world conditions. And that's what drives me crazy. I was watching a couple the other day, and then it's always some guy who goes out into the forest. He finds the emptiest, quietest environment, like a meadow or a forest lane. And then he's busy walking down the lane where it's perfectly quiet and he's testing the audio. It's like, well, this is what the Hero 12 sounds like. This is what the X3000 sounds like. And it's like, well, that doesn't do me any good. A, because you're in a quiet place. Nobody shoots video in those places. I'm in downtown Madame where there is a lot of noise. Plus, he's only recording himself in one direction. He only holds the camera facing him, and he thinks that's an audio test. Like, I don't know why these people do this. Like, if someone's going to test and compare the Hero 12 to the X3000, well, give it to me. I'll do a proper test. Like, I'll go out into Madan in the middle of a traffic jam, in the middle of a crazy, noisy market, walking down the street with buses going by, and then I'll be talking into the camera, and then I'll turn the camera around to face away from me, you know, both situations and then aiming the camera all over the place. Now, what does the audio sound like? And then I'm going to sit down at a table with some other people, film them or film both of us. And then is it picking up my voice and his voice? Now add a third person. Now get on a grab motorcycle, like get on the motorcycle behind the guy and then hold the camera out here. Now is it recording my voice and his voice? Or is it being overwhelmed by the roar of the motorcycle engine? Like, go out into the real world, shoot a real YouTube video, and do all of your testing. Don't waste my time by going into a perfectly quiet meadow all by yourself and only hold the camera in one direction and then try and tell me you did an audio comparison test. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, when he did that test, this guy that I'm thinking of, the GoPro audio sounded great. The Hero 12 sounded great. Sounded better than the X3000. But sure, if you're in the middle of a meadow holding the camera right here, of course it's going to sound good. The built-in mics are good enough, but they fall apart when you go into any kind of a real-world setting. So, ah, stuff drives me crazy. But anyway, <laughs> I don't know that the solution is to buy an X3000. I mean, that would be absolute nonsense because, yeah, it's a eight-year-old camera that still costs four hundred dollars, right? Um, and there, 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 there are better, there are better options than that. I think, in the long term, I would have been better off had I bought the X3000 back in 2017 or whenever it was. 
I think my life would have been much, much better had I bought one of those instead of the GoPro. Buying the GoPro sent me down this path of constant fighting with camera gear and trying to figure things out. And maybe the X3000, you know, it just would have worked and I never would have thought about audio again. I just would have been filming and it's like, oh yeah, audio sounds fine. And I wouldn't have spent like 90% of my life testing microphones. Anyway, that's it. End of my uh, audio microphone rant for this uh, behind the scenes video. I think I only have one YouTube story for today, and that is a new video from Backpacker Ben. It's the one I've been waiting for, and it is called Kicked Out of Pakistan's Most Dangerous City. So I was looking forward to this video because he and Bald Brian and Simon Wilson are traveling together in Pakistan a little bit, and they took the train from Karachi up to a city called Quetta, and I guess they had plans to go from Quetta to somewhere else. And then, according to Bald and Bankrupt's video, they could not get permission from the military to go to this place or wherever they were going. And then they ended up on a bus all the way back to Karachi. And I think that was the end of their Pakistan experience. Um, but in, in Bald and Bankrupt's video, I was really confused. I couldn't figure out anything. I didn't really know where they were trying to go. And then when they were suddenly on a bus going back to Karachi, uh, I wasn't quite sure what happened. He wasn't very clear about the details. So I was hoping that Backpacker Ben, when he released his video about being in Quetta and then being going back to Karachi, that he would give a bit more behind the scenes information, like a, just some more detail. And he did. So I think I have more of a handle on it, though from my perspective, it's still very vague and very unclear. I don't really understand what happened, though to be fair, I don't think they know what happened either. But according to Backpacker Ben's video, it sounds like what happened is they just kind of walked out of their hotel or they were in their hotel and then the police kind of hijacked them. There was somebody waiting for them, either police or military. And I get like, again, there's no detail, there's no background, but I'm just assuming that, you know, they were wandering all over the city, various cameras, you know, all three of them, they each have their own cameras and they're taking video. And it's a militarily sensitive area with a lot of fighting going on. And people are concerned about anybody recording, like who are these people, what are they doing? And I guess word got back Again, I'm making assumptions here because I don't really know and they don't really know. But I think word got back to the military that, oh, you know, these three foreigners are here filming and let's you know, find out what's going on. So somebody was waiting for them. It's, so I assumed that they went to the military to apply for a permit to go somewhere. But from Backpacker Ben's video, it sounds like they were just ambushed. They were just there at the hotel or they were walking out of their hotel and then there was somebody waiting for them and like, come with, come with me boys. And they were piled into the back of some sort of a police vehicle or military vehicle. And then they were driven to some sort of an office. And then they just ended up being driven around the city all day long, going from military place to military place to police station, who knows. And they were just at each of these places for an hour at a time, waiting, talking to people. And then they were trying to get permission and a military escort to go to this other place. And then before, and then they, they, they were at one place and they said they were there for four hours that bald and bankrupt and backpacker Ben. Simon, he'd already left. He was already back in Karachi. So it was just the two of them. And then they said that they were there, held there basically for four hours, just waiting for something to happen. And they had no idea why they were there or what was going on. And then some soldiers or police gathered them up, put them in a vehicle and drove them to the bus station and said, get on this bus and get out, you know, go back to Karachi. So that seems to be what happened. Though, again, my impression from Bald and Bankrupt's video was that they, they took the initiative, that they went to the military to get a permit and were denied so they couldn't go 
and then they got on a bus and went back to Karachi. But according to backpacker Ben's video, like I said, they were just sort of hijacked by the military and then held all day long being driven from place to place and they didn't really know what was happening and then they forced them onto the bus and get out of town. So as he says in his video, they were kicked out, kicked out of Pakistan's most dangerous city. And I did get one other piece of information because as I said in Bald and Bankrupt's video, I don't think I ever heard where they were trying to go. But at one point, Ben spoke to Bald kind of jokingly is like, do you have any idea what's going on? And then Bald says, well, you know, I want to go to Zob and, but they won't let me go there. So then I, he only said the word Zob and I thought, okay, that, at least that's a name. So then I went into Google Maps and I'm typing in very, trying to figure out how do you spell Zob. And I found a city in Pakistan called Zob, you know, Z-H-O-B. And it's like a, you know, two or three hour bus ride north of Quetta. And I guess that's where they wanted to go next and then travel northward through Zob. So I guess that's, they were trying to get permission to go to Zob and then the military said, no, you go back to Karachi. And I guess it was a pretty intense experience overall, a very unpleasant one, uh, emotionally and physically kind of draining and the bus ride, I guess it was like 10 hours on the bus a very uncomfortable bus, I guess, and then they spent the night and then another 10 hours on a bus to finally get back to Karachi. And then Ben and Bald were talking about the experience and they shared the same feeling, which was, yeah, I think we're done in Pakistan. So let, let's just get out. Um, I, I think they, they, they probably discussed the option of, okay, well, we couldn't go that way. Maybe we can just go from Karachi to Lahore and then go from Lahore further to the north but I guess based on their experience in Quetta and talking all the milit to the military and the police and whatever, they concluded that no, because of a political situation, it's too dangerous and too annoying to try to travel in Pakistan right now. So I think they made the decision to just, yeah, let's book our flights out of the country and they're just gonna leave. So they went to Quetta, forced back to Karachi and now they're leaving the country. So that was, that was what I absorbed from uh, Backpacker Ben's video. And now I'm still waiting for Simon Wilson's video. He seemed to be there doing something entirely different. I don't know what he was doing there, but he seemed to be focused more on street food. So I think he was shooting a video about eating Pakistani street food. Though in Bald's video and Ben's video, Backpacker Ben's video, we never actually see him eat any food. In fact, the whole time in all their videos, all they're doing is joking about how none of them dare eat any of the local food. You know, they're, they're going to McDonald's and they're eating inside their, you know, five-star hotel restaurant. They, they're not touching any of the street food, really. So, but maybe off camera, Simon Wilson is busy, you know, eating all the street food and making a video about it. We'll find out when he posts uh, his video, I guess. Yeah, I don't think I have anything else to say. The interest, one interesting thing is that Bald and Bankrupt and Backpacker Ben, they're both using the X3000 Sony camera. Very small, very lightweight, very unobtrusive, you know, very easy to use. But Simon Wilson is a little bit more into getting higher quality video. So he's using some sort of a Canon R something or other. And he's got the giant Joby Gorillapod attached to it, you know, that Casey Neistat made famous. He's got a small lens on the camera, but, and he's got a, he's basically got one of these shotgun microphones on the top as well, you know, a bigger one, more professional one than this. But, so he's using a real camera with a real microphone and a gor Joby Gorillapod, you know. So it looks huge in the video compared to the little Sony X3000, you know, that the other guys are using. So that, that's kind of an interesting uh, contrast. And I was, in previous videos, I was talking about how I'm curious about their luggage because in all the videos I saw, Bald and Bankrupt seemed to have like no luggage at all. You know, his little knapsack on his back was so small that often you don't even notice it. So I was curious how he gets away with that. But in, in Backpacker Ben's video, he 
was carrying something bigger. I think it was the same bag, like when they were getting on the bus to go back to Karachi. It was like, oh, okay. So his bag is kind of bulging. It's bigger than I've ever seen it before. So I was wondering, okay, maybe he really does have a laptop with him and a little bit of electronic gear, like an extension cord and uh, battery chargers. You know, maybe he does have some gear because for the very first time I saw him you know, kind of, you know, kind of hunched over and carrying something that looked a little bit heavier and more and bigger than I remember it ever being, right? So I thought that was kind of interesting. To be honest, I was wondering whether Backpacker, whether Bald and Bankrupt makes a special effort to never show his luggage. Again, to keep that image going of, of being so incredibly light and free and easy. And yet now in Backpacker Ben's video, it's like, oh, okay, you actually have a, you know, nothing like I've got a full-size backpack here. So if you put me beside Bald and Bankrupt, yeah, I look like I'm packed to go through the Andes Mountains and climb Mount Everest compared to him. Still very small and very lightweight, but it looks bigger and heavier than in his own videos. So I do wonder, okay, maybe he is carrying a laptop with him. Because I was thinking he wasn't even carrying a laptop but maybe he is. Anyway, more behind the scenes info that I'd love to get. Like I'd love to get more logistics and figure out exactly the dates, how long they were here and how much this cost. But that, that's the way my, uh, my brain works. But yeah, that's the only YouTube video that is on my mind right now. A movie I just wanted to mention in passing that I just watched kind of interesting. I guess you'd call it kind of an indie flick um, starring Nicolas Cage and it is called Dream Scenario. Interesting film, an unusual one and I love the concept, the idea, and I won't give away the whole movie because it does go on and things change, but at the beginning and if you watch the trailer, I mean this is all very obvious in the marketing that we've got a guy played by Nicolas Cage. He's like a middle-aged, moving into elderly professor. You know, he's balding, he's got glasses on, he's kind of a, kind of a weak, timid sort of person. And for some reason that it goes kind of unexplained, people start dreaming about him. Like people that he knows you know, they'll say, oh, you were in my dream last night. Like his daughter, his, w I don't think his wife, but his daughter. And then he finds out that in the dream, he doesn't do anything. Like the person who's dreaming is having this big adventure. There's usually something dangerous or dramatic or exciting going on. But Nicolas Cage's character just kind of walks into the dream and then just stands there looking around, just sort of like, hey. Like he doesn't do anything ever. He never gets involved. And you see all these really interesting dreams where crazy things are happening. People are, you know, in very dangerous situations and you'd think that, oh, this stranger is going to show up in my dream and help me. But then this stranger, this person they don't even know, some guy with a beard and a bald head, you know, balding, and glasses just sort of walks into the dream and just doesn't help, doesn't do anything, just stands there and watches, right? And then this phenomenon gets bigger and bigger and bigger and people all over the world, or at least all over the United States, are reporting this, that, yeah, this guy just shows up in my dreams and it's him, it's the same Nicolas Cage character is just appearing in the dreams of hundreds, probably thousands of people all over the United States. And that is what the movie is based on. And how does the Nicolas Cage character react to this? Like it involves, you know, the storyline involves social media, um, just, you know, fame and fortune, you know, like suddenly he becomes 
a very well-known person and and how does he re how does he react to that how does he respond to it and what should he do like how should he behave and then the story starts to build from there and some crazier things uh, start to happen i enjoyed it it's different you know, I love anything that is unusual. This is not the standard type of story we see in movies these days. You know, it's not, it's not Spider-Man 12, right? It's something unusual. The, the director, the writer, the producers, they were trying to push the envelope in terms of filmmaking and come up with a new idea and uh, talk about unusual things. But one thing I noticed is that after I watched it, then I went to look at, you know, the trailer and some movie review reactions, things like that. And everybody was focusing on how funny it was that, oh, Nicolas Cage has never been funnier. His greatest performance of the last 20 years, his sense of, you know, timing, comedic timing. It's funny, 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 funny. And when I watched the movie, I did not find it funny in any way. I found nothing funny about it. So I don't know, I mean, I mean, it is sort of amusing the idea that people are dreaming about him and they don't even know who he is and there are amusing situations and yet I found the movie, if anything, I found it disturbing. You know, it is disturbing in a lot of ways. And I found the Nicolas Cage character to be so annoying because he was so weak and so timid and he was so much the victim. And I hate characters like that. Characters who never stand up for themselves. They just take it on the chin from everybody. Everybody gives him a hard time. His daughter criticizes him. His other daughter criticizes him. His wife is on his back constantly criticizing him and giving him a hard time and being upset with him. And at some point I'm thinking, dude, stand up for yourself, fight back. Like everybody, you know, he got in so much trouble because of these dreams and everybody blamed it on him and it wasn't his fault. He had nothing to do with it, right? He, you know, it's not like he has a superpower where he deliberately goes into other people's dreams. They're dreaming about him and he doesn't even know. He, he's got nothing to do with it. So, okay, if I was in your dream and you were in trouble and I didn't help you in your dream, well, you have no right to be angry with me. It was a dream for one thing. It was your dream. You were dreaming about me. I had nothing to do with it. So get off my back, right? Like, get over yourself, you know? It's your dream. Um, so, but he never stood up for himself. He never fought back. He seemed like such a victim. And I almost stopped watching the movie because of that, because it just drove me crazy. And then at the end, um, I guess this is a uh, spoiler, so if you don't want to hear the spoiler, but I imagine most people will never get around to watching this movie, but if you don't want to hear this, jump ahead. But towards the end of the story, because of the whole situation, he ends up separated from his wife and his daughters. You know, they're basically getting divorced. And as far as I can tell, it wasn't his choice. You know, his wife is divorcing him because of all this dream stuff. And at the end of the movie, we see that this has happened. And then he is whining, like going back to his wife and he wants to get back together. It's, oh, maybe, you know, and he's like whining. And, and I'm thinking, you're better off without her. Like, why would you even want to stay with this woman? She seemed horrible to me. She was a nag. She was attacking him, blaming him. Everything was his fault. She was never on his side, always on other people's side, telling him he was doing everything wrong and everything was his fault. But he didn't do anything, right? So I'm thinking, you know, she wants to divorce you. Fine, you're better getting rid of this woman. Get her out of your life, you know? But he was like, oh, you know, take me back, you know, we can, you know, uh, and I'm thinking, dude, just quit being such a victim. Um, quit being so timid, right? 
<laughs> and even when it came to the dream, to me it seemed like it gave him some kind of power, right? These people were attacking him for what he did in their dreams. And I was thinking, I mean, it's completely irrational. Like, quit, you know, it's not logical. But at the same time, people were still blaming him, even though it wasn't his fault. And I'm thinking, well, turn it around on them. This guy is getting in your face and he's angry with you. Well, fight back for one thing, but also say to the guy, oh, okay, so uh, next time you go to sleep and you start dreaming, you better think about what I'm gonna do to you in your dream. Like, you, like either back off, leave me alone, or the next time you dream about me, I'm gonna do this to you and I'm gonna, like pretend that he actually have the, has the power to do something in their dreams. Like go pure Freddy Krueger on them. Like he doesn't have Freddy Krueger powers, but you know, pretend that you do get these people to back off, you know, like flip the script on them and they're blaming you for what you're doing in their dreams. Like buy into that scenario and say, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> I control you, you know, so you better leave me alone. You better, you know, give me a raise or I'm going to sneak into your dreams and I'm going to do this, you know, use your power. And he never even did that, you know, it's this guy. I found it so frustrating to watch him just get beat up, get attacked, get criticized by everybody, even his daughters, even his wife, you know, everyone was on him, attacking him, and he didn't do anything. None of it was his fault. So anyway, I found that victim attitude and the meek and timid personality that he portrayed, you know, I found that so annoying by the end of the video. But anyway, <laughs> it was fun to watch. It really was. And I love the concept. I do wish there was more at the end. I, I wanted more from the story than I got. But um, I still, yeah, enjoyed it quite a bit. So that was Dream Scenario, starring uh, Nicolas Cage. And a classic Planet Doug pet peeve to end uh, today's video. Something I've been, that's been going on for a long time. I mean, I'm on the internet a lot and I go to a lot of websites, you know, news stories about this, that, the other thing. And quite often, I don't, I don't know what percentage, I don't even know if it's the majority of the time, but a lot of the websites that I visit, I will get a message that comes up that says, this website wants to send you notifications and you know we've blocked it because i guess my macbook the automated automated systems or google chrome anyway this website wants to send me notifications and it's been blocked and then i get a choice of allow or block and this con this message comes up all the time and i find it really annoying because i'm pretty sure that in the entire history of the internet of all the billions of people on the planet nobody has ever clicked on allow right there's a news story about nicholas cage in the movie dream scenario so i click on that news story it takes me to a website about movies and it says oh we want to send you notifications allow no i'm not like why would i want random websites from all over the internet just starting bombarding me with notifications of course, I'm not going to allow it. Block, 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 block. Everybody will block. Like, has there ever been a single person in the history of the universe who has ever said, oh, yeah, I want notifications from this random website. I will allow. Oh, they want to send me notifications, allow. Nobody has ever clicked on allow even once. So why, are this, why is this still happening? And why do they keep asking us? Are they hoping that one day, oh, Doug is in a better mood today, he's going to allow us to send him notifications for the rest of his life? No, I am going to not allow this, ever. So quit asking me. But they always, they keep asking, and I don't know why this is still ongoing. You'd think at some point they would figure out that, well, nobody's ever going to allow it, so we should just stop asking. But apparently, no, you know, they haven't gotten to this point.
<laughs> so that is the uh, Planet Doug pet peeve for today. All right, that is it, winding down. And as I said, I have a few things to do today. I'm gonna to try and find a hotel in Tanjung Balai. So to sum up my plans, tomorrow morning, train to Tanjung Balai. I spend Sunday in Tanjung Balai. Monday morning, I'm on the ferry to Malaysia. And Monday night, I will be back in uh, Port Dixon. Pretty exciting stuff. And after that, like I said, uh, it's Chinese New Year. So I have no idea what I'm going to do for the Chinese New Year holidays. I, I haven't lined up any kind of accommodation, you know, like affordable accommodation for that time period. So uh, yeah, I, I still have to figure that out. So that's it. I have to start packing up for tomorrow morning, go get something to eat. And otherwise, uh, yeah, get ready for uh, the train trip. Make sure all my batteries are charged up. I'll shoot a video on the train, you know, make a YouTube video out of it. Riding a train in Sumatra, what is that like? I noticed like most of the YouTube videos about trains, they do focus on the luxury trains. So there's a lot of very popular YouTube videos from Java. You know, I rode on the $40 luxury train, you know, the $15 express bullet train. Those are very popular videos but I'm gonna be getting on the local rickety, you know, slow train, and um, that's gonna be my video, but we'll see. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Love trains, love riding on trains, and we'll see how it all works out. So that's it. Have a good day, and I'll see you in the next video.